Hello and welcome to part 5 of Earth, Fire and Ice. Part 5 is a ship and suite tour of the Regent Seven Seas Splendor. Part 5 also includes the dining and drinking guide as well as an entertainment guide and some thoughts on the region experience including the good, the bad and the ugly of this particular voyage. So with that in mind, let's take a moment to talk about the beautiful Regent Seven Seas Splendor. The Splendor holds 746 guests, 548 crew, giving it a passenger to crew ratio of 1.36 to 1. The Splendor has 373 suites, all with private verandas, 10 passenger decks, 735 feet in length, 102 feet across the beam, and a gross tonnage of 55,498 tons. The keel laying ceremony was performed in June of 2018. It was launched in February of 2020 and was christened by none other than Christy Brinkley on February 21st, 2020. Well, let's get started with a ship tour and we'll include the dining and drinking guide as we go through the deck by deck tour. There are several dining options aboard the Splendor, including four specialty restaurants, three of which require a reservation, one of which, Sete Mari, is open seating, but unlike some other lines, there is no upcharge to dine in these specialty restaurants. Premium wine and spirits are included in your cruise fare and available across the ship from several different venues. Non-alcoholic beverages such as soft drinks and coffees are also included. So let's get started with a deck by deck tour of the Regent 7C Splendor. There is a deck three, but passenger access is very limited to only the medical center and tender services. So our tour really gets started with deck four. First stop is the Constellation Theater, the main show place and staging area for excursions aboard the ship. The theater is two stories with an overhead balcony section on deck five. The theater is a beautiful area featuring all of the onboard production shows and the headlining guest entertainers. Right outside the theater on both port and starboard sides are the boutiques. The boutiques feature anything from what you may have forgot to bring to that Louis Vuitton or Rolex watch that you may decide you really need. Continuing toward the aft of the ship, in the midship we find the Splendor Lounge. The Splendor Lounge is open sometimes during the afternoon for special events and always in the evening for drinks and dancing, usually featuring the Vivasi duo. Late in the evening, they will have a DJ or sometimes even karaoke. Across from the Splendor Lounge, midship on starboard, is the casino. Now the casino is a rather spacious one for a ship this size featuring many different slot machines, as well as some table games like blackjack, craps, and even a roulette wheel. Compass Rose is the main dining room and is what Regent calls the largest specialty restaurant at sea. As explained, the reason for that statement is the always available menu, which can be customized according to the guest wishes. It's a wonderful open and inviting space featuring custom chandeliers and famously Versace charger plates. The menu is divided into always available and the chef's selection for the evening. You are always of course welcome to select from either side of the menu. For this special New Year's Eve menu, we mixed it up a bit and started off with some Norwegian style gravlocks, then jumped to the special crab meat stuffed jumbo prawn and a little sautéed foie gras with honey and figs, a Cure Royale Sorbet as a palate cleanser, a sake miso glazed salmon on coconut sticky rice, and surf and turf with a perfectly prepared beef tenderloin and lobster tail. And we finished off the meal by sharing a baked Alaska. Open in the mornings for a la carte breakfast, the Compass Rose opens at 6.30 in the evening for dinner and closes at 9.30. Compass Rose is open seating and does not require reservation. We ate several times at Compass Rose and each time we were able to enjoy 
a leisurely and perfectly cooked meal. The beautiful atrium area is much more than a hallway to get you from point A to point B and actually functions in many different ways as an entertainment space itself. Featuring everything from special events, such as wine tastings, games hosted by the entertainment staff, wow. and even full-blown parties and musical events. Moving to Deck 5, and before we start our tour, I'm going to mention a little bit about navigating the Splendor. This is not a huge ship, and actually it's quite easy to navigate with good signage at the fore and aft elevator banks and both stairwells. Additional signage is also staggered around the ship in strategic spots. On Deck 5, we have the upper levels of the Constellation Theater and all guest services. In addition to guest services, there is also a business center with four computers for anyone's use. Guest services includes reception, restaurant reservations, destination services, and the concierge. All around this beautiful lobby-like area were beautiful pieces of art like these Lalique vases and other hanging art. Also on Deck 5, midship on the starboard side is the Meridian Lounge. Open from 6 until midnight, the Meridian Lounge is also open for afternoon tea from 4 to 5. In the evenings though, it really shines as a great venue for before and after dinner drinks. All of the bars on the Splendor have a specialty menu, and the Meridian Lounge specializes in gin-based drinks. In the evening, musical entertainment is provided by the Splendor Band. Members of the Splendor Band or Jukester, a sort of DJ jukebox kind of thing. Directly across from the Meridian Lounge on Deck 5 is the Coffee Connection. The Coffee Connection is your access to specialty coffees served up by the barista on duty from 6.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. or by rolling your own at one of the two coffee makers at the opposite end. There's also a nice al fresco area for those days that allow such a thing. And although not strictly a bar, the Coffee Connection does offer liquor infused, especially coffees, if you have a hankering for that sort of thing. And while not strictly speaking a restaurant either, the Coffee Connection does have enough things to make a small sandwich or a fruit plate in the afternoon and desserts, cookies, and pastries or those other times you're feeling a bit peckish. Continuing aft and on the starboard side of the ship, we have the entrance to the Serene Spa and Wellness Center. The Serene Spa and Wellness Center takes up a good chunk of real estate at the back of the ship and offers a wide array of spa services, from beauty and makeup to haircuts for the gentlemen, to massages, aromatherapy, and other things that may be of interest to you. It is all offered for an additional charge. At the back of the ship, there is a small infinity pool accessible either by going through the spa or along the walkway on the outside of the ship. Also on deck five on the port side is the Pacific Rim. Pacific Rim features Asian inspired cuisine. We enjoyed Pacific Rim quite a bit and found the menu large and varied enough to hold our interest for several visits. It is a beautiful venue and has a distinctly Asian feel with the dragon greeting you at the entrance and even Asian inspired lampshades. Each dinner started with this roasted seaweed, edamame and honey mustard dipping sauce. Since we are fond of sashimi, we always started each meal with a sashimi platter and went on to an appetizer or two before moving on to our entrees, which we always shared. All of this goodness made Pacific Rim one of our favorite dining venues. In fact, we dined there five times during the space of the 21 day trip. And while every dish was not a banger, most were. The exception to that is probably some of the sides and an absolutely horrible rendition of a Tom Kha Gai soup. 
Next up are decks 6, 7, 8, and 9, which are all sweet decks with the one major exception. And that exception is the well-appointed fitness center tucked in above the spa at the aft of the ship on deck 6. As you walk into the fitness center, you see windows looking down into the infinity pool on deck 5 with resistance training and aerobic training equipment and some free weights consisting of dumbbells on one side and more aerobic equipment in the big room on the port side. On the port side is also a bunch of stationary bikes for spin classes and a fairly large room that can be used for yoga, stretching, or dancer size. You get to the workout center from deck six, just walk towards the aft until you can't walk anymore, open a door, and there you are. Otherwise, the suite layout is pretty logical with odd numbered cabins on the port side and even numbered cabins on the starboard side. More on suites coming up. 10, in addition to being suites, has two of the dining venues at the aft end of the ship. First is Chartreuse, region's take on a French-style bistro. Right away, you'll notice the forest of wine glasses, indicating that they are pretty serious about their wine here in Chartreuse. The restaurant itself is exceedingly elegant, with a decidedly French aesthetic and appeal. The menu itself does not change, but there is more than enough variety to keep you coming back for more. And we did visit Chartreuse a total of two times during the voyage. All of the dishes that we tried at Chartreuse were well prepared and very tasty. This is a lobster bisque, by the way. And this is escargots cooked in butter and cream. And along with all the rest of these dishes were well prepared and beautifully presented. And while you must make a reservation to dine at Chartreuse, there is no specialty restaurant fee or upcharge and it is included in your cruise fare. And as in the other restaurants requiring a reservation ahead of time, that reservation can be made online prior to embarkation. In our case, only one reservation per specialty restaurant, while more can be added once you are on board. Next door at the aft of Deck 10 is Prime 7. Prime 7 is region steak on a old style American steak and chop house. And while you can imagine that here beef is king, there are other items on the menu for those that don't do beef. Of course, if you are a beef eater, you can't do much better than this. A prime dry aged bone in ribeye cooked perfectly to your preferred temperature. If beef's not your thing, then there's Dover sole or a seafood sampler platter or pork chops, lamb chops, pretty much name it. The meal always ends with these petty fours and your choice of desserts, this key lime pie and this cheesecake were standouts. Hidden right between Prime 7 and Chartreuse is a restaurant that very few passengers will get to see, and that is The Study. As I understand it, The Study is exclusively available to those guests residing in the $11,000 to $20,000 a night Regent Suite. Moving up to Deck 11, we find a deck that is all public spaces and no suites. Starting at the front of the ship, we find the Observation Lounge, a well-equipped drinking and entertainment venue that overlooks the bow of the ship. Spacious and comfortable, the Observation Lounge is a great place to get a before or after dinner drink or have a sit down and listen to the resident pianist. The Observation Lounge is also used for many different daytime activities and gatherings. Right next door to the Observation Lounge is the card room. Besides having several card tables, there are many different board games available, from Monopoly to chess to Parcheesi. The card room is also home to smaller, more intimate gatherings and meetings. And next door to the card room is the Connoisseurs Club. The Connoisseurs Club is one of the two smoking areas aboard the ship, the other being a glass cage on the pool deck. And it is here that you can purchase and smoke your fine scars, including, I am told, some Cubanos, or indulge in some ultra-premium liquors, such as this Louis XIII Cognac for $125 for a 1.5-ounce glass. Or perhaps a different Cognac, American Whiskey, or a nice Scotch, is more to your liking. 
All of these liquors and other fine wines are available for an upcharge. Across the hall on the starboard side is the library. Now what's unique about this library is it's really a library. It's not some truncated or abbreviated form of a library found on other ships, but instead has literally hundreds of books on display and for your reading pleasure. And along with those books are plenty of quiet reading niches where you can park and enjoy that book. Also on deck 11 is the Culinary Arts Kitchen, where you can sign up for various courses, some of them destination focused, and learn some of the tricks of the trade from a pro. Right outside the windows of the Culinary Arts Kitchen is the pool and jacuzzi area. This area features a goodly sized pool and two covered hot tubs, along with plenty of comfortable recliners and seating. Adjacent to the pool area is the pool bar, open from 10 in the morning till 7 at night. It's here that you can get your frozen daiquiris or pina coladas, as well as a little extra rum for your ice cream. Also on 11 is the pool grill, open for breakfast and lunch, or coffee and cookies anytime. Breakfast is what Regent calls the fitness breakfast, and includes a few energy bars and what I would call a continental breakfast. Lunch is the big time for the pool grill since it is a come as you are type thing. And lunch features this wooden cardboardy kind of pizza, as well as a nice build your own salad kind of bar, a few sandwiches, wraps, and grab and go items. There will also be several themed lunches like this Greek day, a seafood extravaganza day, and other themed lunches with a chef serving. But where the pool grill shines, in my opinion, is its menu. After looking over the menu, you can either order here at the order station, or a waiter will eventually come over and take your order. The menu is, of course, heavy on things like hot dogs, hamburgers, sandwiches, but there are also standouts like lobster nachos and hot wings, with enough variety that keeps you coming back for more. At the aft of the ship on deck 11 is La Veranda. La Veranda is the breakfast and lunch buffet option with plenty of seating inside and outside. The buffet has plenty of choices and variety. The outside al fresco area has an interesting setup with partitions in the seating area that can block wind if it is windy. As much choice as there was for breakfast, there is even more choice in the afternoon for lunch including a carving station that changes daily, as well as buffet items that change daily. Many of the selections on the buffet mirror the specialty items of the day at the pool grill. There's also a pasta station, a build your own salad bar, lots of seafood choices, and plenty of desserts. Other venues like Chartreuse and Prime 7 are open for lunch as well, for a menu-driven a la carte sort of experience, but we usually went to La Veranda for our lunchtime meal. In the evening, half of La Veranda turns into Settimari, an Italian-style restaurant that features open seating on a first-come, first-served basis and features a nice variety of Italian wines, both complimentary and for an upcharge. Your sommelier will be happy to help you with those selections. To start your meal, you can select your appetizers from a small buffet area after ordering your entrees. After a couple of visits, I settled on a nice Chianti that I enjoyed and an equally nice or better Barbera. Settimari features freshly made pasta like this pillowy gnocchi and Italian favorites such as this Chapino seafood stew and this wonderful asabuco or braised veal shank. Once you are finished with your meal, you are welcome to go to the small dessert buffet for your choice of desserts. Or instead, if you'd like to indulge in a small glass of lemoncello, that is also available. There are a few suites on deck 12, but it is primarily what Regent calls the sports deck. Here you will find some interesting options if you like to stay active, 
such as a jogging track or a track that you can walk around the top of the ship. A driving cage, complete with golf balls and drivers. The typical cruise shuffleboard court, and even a pickleball court complete with all the equipment you'll need. There is also an interesting 18 hole mini golf course. As we move around here, it's interesting to note that there are two holes on every green. And the idea is you make your way around the golf course one way, turn around and come back the other way for the full 18 hole experience. Continuing on from the mini putt course, we have a croquet and bocce ball court and a bago court. And tucked away but not pictured is a table tennis area. Deck 12 is also the absolute best place for an unobstructed view for taking pictures of the area in which you are sailing. There is but one more deck and that is deck 14. Deck 14 is special because it houses the fantabulous Regent Suite. The Regent Suite is 4,500 square feet, more or less, and features many things like two bedrooms, two bathrooms, a grand piano, butler service, and an in-suite spa area for the master bedroom, and so much more. But all accommodations aboard the Regent 7C Splendor are suites, and all have verandas. I include this short glimpse then to the nine different categories of suites aboard the Splendor and encourage you if you want more detail on any one of these suite plans and the amenities offered with each suite to go to rssc.com and check out the details. that we had was a superior suite and I offer up a short tour here. So welcome to suite 815. Every suite aboard the Splendor offers nice counter space, a welcoming environment, a nice bottle of champagne chilled and waiting for you when you check in. In our case, a king size bed with all suite categories below a superior suite offering up a queen size bed. And while not the $200,000 mattress found in the Regent suite, the bed was very comfortable. There is a bar area that features glassware. A small refrigerator that is stocked daily with whatever you want. A spacious and accommodating bathroom, including a tub, two sinks, and a nice large walk-in shower. The walk-in closet is enormous for a cruise ship and has drawers, a safe, and plenty of hanging area. A note about the TV, it is an interactive system and you will be able to find your daily schedules as well as your bills and so forth on the TV as you go. There is also plenty of on-demand movies and other entertainment available as well. The veranda for our suite was spacious enough and included two chairs and a small table. Well, let's talk entertainment. Region offers up an abundance of entertainment in the evenings, from production shows to guest entertainers to musical entertainment scattered around the ship. There are resident musical entertainers aboard. It include the Vivance Duo, which is a 
pop, even disco kind of vibe. The Splendor Band, which includes seven members when in full troop mode, a cocktail pianist, special themed parties, and even roll your own entertainment in the form of a DJ jukebox kind of thing and even karaoke night. The Splendor Production Company put on several different production shows in the Constellation Theater. Each show was well put together and well performed with both the singers and dancers doing a fantastic job. There were several guest entertainers that flew in, did two shows, and then were gone. And each and every one of them was entertaining and well worth the watch. There were two guest speakers aboard, one that dealt with show business and the other dealt with the more political side of things, specializing in South American politics, the region in which we were sailing. There are, of course, the other regular cruise things that you can do, like bingo, two types of quizzes, mensa and trivia, special events, sudoku and crosswords, and even needlepoint. And don't forget those culinary classes. So let's talk about the all-important Regent Seven Seas experience, what's included, and what went right, what went wrong, and the pros and cons of this particular voyage, followed by my overall impressions. Let's start with pricing. Now, no doubt, Regent Cruises are expensive, and the simplest pricing structure offers two options, an all-inclusive fare and an all-inclusive cruise fare. Keeping in mind, this is for the lowest price cabin. These are some cruises for the Seven Seas Splendor. You can see that in some instances, the difference between the two cruise fares is quite significant. So what is the difference? Well, an all-inclusive cruise fare is just that. It is airport to airport with all airfare and transfers. An all-inclusive cruise fare is port to port with no airfare and no transfers. Region is much more inclusive than most cruise lines, so let's talk about what those inclusions are. On the all-inclusive airfare, you get round-trip business class airfare on all intercontinental itineraries, airport to hotel, hotel to ship, ship to hotel and airport transfers, premium wine and spirits at all times, no additional wine and spirits package to buy, your in-suite bar and fridge set up your way and restock daily, all specialty coffees and all soft drinks, world-class dining and all specialty dining is included, 24-hour room service with an extensive menu, all onboard programs, entertainment, shows, activities, and events with a nominal upcharge for some of the liquor tasting and that sort of thing, unlimited premium shore excursions, port shuttle service in most ports, Wi-Fi and internet is included, valet laundry service is included, and all onboard gratuities are included. And on select cruises, even some pre and post cruise extensions are included. Let's talk in a little more detail about some of those inclusions. Business class airfare is a big one and included on all intercontinental flights. Now you have to be careful and double check your itinerary and schedule because Regent, as in every other cruise line today, is doing it as cheaply as they can. And it's going to be up to you to police that. Premium wine and spirits are included and ultra premium brands such as Louis XIII Cognac, if that's your thing, are available for an upcharge. All dining, including the four specialty restaurants on board, are included. 24-7 in-suite dining is included as well, with a rather extensive menu available at any time. There is always your choice of several shore excursions in each port and all are included. There are some special pricey shore excursions for small group or helicopter tours and so forth. And time and schedule allowing, you are of course welcome to take more than one shore excursion in each port. 
Wi-Fi is included. However, it's sort of a good news, bad news, good news sort of thing. The good news is it's free. The bad news is it kind of sucks. But then the good news is Regent is in the process of re-equipping all their ships with the Starlink system, which should offer a better, faster connection to the internet. Here's another big one for me. Valet laundry service is included. Now this is a standard wet wash, not a dry cleaning. Dry cleaning is included in some of the upper level suites, but not down where I stay. But still, it's a good perk. And there is a laundrette on each passenger deck that can be used at no additional charge. And here's another biggie. Gratuities are prepaid. I know that means it's built into your cruise fare, but you don't have to fork out hundreds of dollars at the end of the cruise because it's already been included. The crew will of course be paid their share of the gratuities, depending on how many guests are sailing on a particular itinerary. And if you like, you are more than welcome to give somebody who gave you extra special service something a little extra as well. Well, let's talk about it. Is there value in a Regent cruise? Well, to me, yes. Although it's certainly a higher priced cruise, there are many inclusions that make it worthwhile to me. Not the least being the included business class airfare. I'm not young and I'm not small. So on those longer intercontinental flights, business class airfare is a definite perk for me. And as I said, while a good perk, you're still going to have to monitor it. Example, on this voyage, we had Flu United for the trip to Peru. United changed the itinerary of our flight leaving from home to Houston, leaving us only 30 minutes to transfer from our plane to our flight to Peru. If there were any delays or any holdups, where the flight originated, then we would have a very difficult time making it to our next flight. Not to mention the danger of our luggage not making it on to the plane. A simple call to region and the itinerary was rearranged to give us a longer holdover time in Houston. The other big inclusions, for me at least, was no upcharge on the specialty dining, all drinks included so no drink package to worry about or buy, built-in gratuities, all shore excursions, and the included Wi-Fi, as crappy as it was. Add that to an absolutely beautiful ship and a sweet and accommodating crew, where service was warm and accommodating and never stuffy, and we had a pretty good package. The ship itself was spectacular, and while it was a bit over the top and somewhat ostentatious in spots, the craftsmanship and fantastic attention to detail made for an interesting and comfortable environment that simply exuded luxury. So the long and the short of it is, this, without doubt, was one of the best cruises we have ever taken, with the least amount of hiccups. Aside from the little ripple in the air itinerary, things were universally good, if not wonderful. And add to all that, that the inclusions may very well mean that you will have a zero dollar bill at the end of the cruise, all of it having been paid up front. So the bottom line is, would we take another Regent cruise? And the answer to that is, well, yes, we would. In fact, we have booked another Regent cruise for the end of 2025. At the end of 2025, we will be headed to the Middle East, starting in Barcelona, Spain, and ending in Dubai. Thank you for watching, and please like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell to keep abreast of all new issues to be notified when a new video drops. We have some new things in process, including some travel shorts and some upcoming trips where we will venture above the Arctic Circle going from Tromsø, Norway to Reykjavik, Iceland. And then a grand 61 day adventure exploring the Pacific Rim as we venture from Tokyo to Sydney, Australia. 
As always, thank you for watching. Safe and happy travels from Tease, Cruise, and Travel Muse.